friends, welcome back to the Film Alchemist Podcast, the show where we take the movies we love, break them apart, to find out what gives them their magic. I'm your host, Josh Griffey, joined as always by my friend, co-host, and he who took the road less traveled, Alex Dantino. Welcome to the show, Nuwanda. Uh, we are here continuing our, our journey through uh, our curation this month. The pod goes back to school. It's that time of year. The summer's coming to an end. We got to hit the books with a vengeance. So we're back at school with today's scholarly journey through the Dead Poet Society. A wonderful, if not super traumatic movie. Yeah. Before that, a bit of business. Everybody, it's official. We're on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Film Alchemist Pod. The only and best way to support the show. Not only. I just thought I'd put some action words in there. Try to draw some some zest. Yeah. I like that. But it is the best way to support the show. It means the world to us. We work really hard to make sure that uh, for your donation to the show, you get a lot in return. Um, And it doesn't have to be much, guys. Every little bit helps. We have a huge Patreon exclusive library. We do commentaries every month. We've got mini series. We have a wonderful community of people that have come together to support us and help us with the show. We would be honored if you would find it in your heart. A small donation, man. I'm telling you, every little bit counts when you are a podcast like us. So thank you in advance for that support. Go to the YouTube, subscribe over there. That's a free and easy thing to do. Uh, Phil Malcolmus, you can see content over there. We're on all the socials you're on, including TikTok. Find us, reach out, communicate with us. Uh, do the algorithm stuff, right? Share, repost, all that, engagements. You know, algorithm, algorithm, algorithm. Al- the algorithm is becoming our Kurtwood Smith, right? Just really fucking... D- determining yeah. our course and we need your help really trying to get us to go to medical that. school yeah exactly well when you uh kneel before the algorithm sometimes you're like maybe i should have studied harder but here we find ourselves uh the email film alchemist pod at gmail.com reach out get a hold of us movies you want curation ideas anything we love to hear uh from listeners thank you in advance for that as well make sure you go to misfitparade.net so you can see some of the movies that we're making uh the short film sugar tits is out on the festival circuit. Which is uh, really maybe good. I'll be in a town near you. You can come watch the movie with us, right? You can see me being a creep on the screen while I'm a creep next to you. And re- I'm not a creep. That's just <laughs> acting. It's called <laughs> acting, my fellow, right? Um, so come find MisfitParade.net. Follow all that. By the time you will have heard that, we will have started our first feature film, Mr. Cream Jeans Heidi Hole. So exciting things over there. It'd be great if you uh, would join us and follow that journey as well. And make sure you check out my friends at Looper. They have recently hired me to do some video work. So I'm over there on camera talking about movies. Uh, so if you like us here, there's a chance you'll like it over there. All right. All right, Alex. Yeah. I'm going to give a brief claimer at the start of this episode. Yeah. You and I had a long talk beforehand. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if the listeners know a lot about what happened uh, to me this summer. I think some of them know that our dear friend, one of my favorite people, right? If the podcast gave us nothing else than a reason for me and you to stay close friends when I moved and that we got to meet Carmelita Valdez McCoy. Yes. This whole journey, this 600, 700 episode journey was worth it. Uh, she's so wonderful. She stepped in and filled in for a little bit. Um, I lost my brother to suicide this summer. Um, those of you who have been through stuff like this, it's just, it's horrible and it's awful. Um, I've tried to stay busy and keep my mind out of it. There's not really a good way to ever deal with anything like this. And I was just committed to, I'm going to, you know, get to work and, and try to, you know, make my life honorable like worth living still right really really kind of suck the marrow out of life as they say in this movie um appreciate the time i have left with the people i still have when we came up with this curation <laughs> i literally was like oh dead poet society i was like what a fun wonderful inspiring movie i fucking kid you not i did not for a second think about the uh just devastating boogeyman looming at the end of the movie for me and my wife, and boy, oh boy, there are certain things that happen in your life, and I'm sure listeners will relate to this, where um, all of a sudden you just lose a movie. There's a really good chance things like this, The Iron Claw, there's a lot of movies now that like I probably just will not subject myself to again. 
So I wanted to do a small disclaimer because I'm sure the people who do know are like, why the fuck did he pick this movie? Uh, and if you didn't know, if I lose my shit a little bit or I sound not on my game, uh, that's why I honestly just, it was a complete omission. I was just like, it's Robin Williams teaching kids and I love this movie. I think it's beautiful. I love the relationship. I love movies that find characters at this young age where life can be anything, right? And you can do anything and that that little things are worth doing the most grandiose gesture for, right? You're slaying dragons every day about little things because you're deciding what it means to be a human, what it means to live a life worth living, right? Um, and this movie just does a great job of that, right? And it's it's extra cool too because it's it's rich kids, which I fucking hate rich people in movies. I despise them. So these little kind of it's it's beautiful to watch these little robots, right? These little future doctors and senators and you know bankers, whatever the fuck. Um, just get opened up to the idea, man, that there's so much beautiful shit in this world. It has nothing to do with the four pillars or what your parents want or money or stuff like this world everywhere around you. Right. In a small cave off campus, there's there's magic about you. Um, it truly is just a beautiful, beautiful movie. I, I fucking adore this movie, even if this will be the last time I maybe ever watch it, man. Um, so, Alex, opening thoughts on Dead Poets Society. I will say point of order. I I, um, I could have been a better co-host and actually like spoken up and said, you <laughs> for this. no, because um, it's one of those like how it's I generally weird. Th- this is like, OK, of the 700 shows we've done at this point. Yeah, I generally do not push back <laughs> on movies unless I'm just like we usually kind of like you pick half. I pick half and we, we run on it. Yeah, I, I generally don't push back on things unless I genuinely do not enjoy the movie we're going to talk about which i yes. think is maybe in that's the, kind of our in, one rule let's not just pick a movie to all the way just shit on it in the 700 shows we've done i think that's maybe happened twice yeah where i'm like i don't want to do that because i hated that movie like and it's vice versa it's happened maybe twice for each of us yeah mm-hmm. um <laughs> i don't generally try to tell you but in the middle of watching the movie <laughs> Especially the last 20 minutes, I just sort of went, oh, fudge. Right at yeah. the end there, I was like, this might not go well. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, <laughs> well, there's also something when you're a person who's gone through like this moment, right? This wasn't this like is, uh, my grandparent died of old age, natural thing, no, right? No, it was, like, it was a traumatic thing. Something very um, traumatic happened. It was unnatural. It's not right. And there becomes this thing where you feel like you're walking around with like a dick on your forehead. Like everyone's looking at you in this way of like. Oh, I don't know how to talk. It's uncomfortable. Uh, it's hard, man. I get it. I've been that friend to other people. And when it's you, all of a sudden, you just are like, wow, what the fuck? And uh, wow, I wish I would have done this and this. I will tell you, I do not expect that from anyone. Um, this was a completely uh, just, you know, honestly. And I think that's the great thing about the movie. The movie is not reduced to. Because when I was a film student, that's kind of one of the cliches, right? Is every movie would, you know, like nine out of ten projects would end in a suicide because it's dramatic and serious and when we're that age that feels like this like you know grandiose statement and this one i don't think is done in that kind of way i think the movie is so wonderful and works uncoupled from that ending that i just i literally i was so focused on the beauty of this movie yeah the idea that i wish that maybe if i'm honest i've had two or three people in my life that just like not even supported you is the right word, but like nurtured you, told you to fucking run on things you believe, right? Like I sat watching this movie next to my own son who has dreams of, you know, playing professional sports and whatever. And it's like, do I want to be the dad who's just like, yeah, that's probably not going to work out for you. Here's some statistics. Or do you just want to say, run fast, child, like run and dream. And man, who knows if you fucking work hard, like who fucking knows? Like the shitty normal life, that we all end up leading, right? The, you know, the kind of world that every 90s movie was about, the cubicle and the crushing, you know, mundanity of it. That'll be there. That's there for all of us, man. That's the net. Why not fucking see how far you can walk? And I love the idea, like Robin Williams in this movie, 
It's hard. If we had to pick, like, a what is your favorite Robin Williams performance, you know My what I mean? Favorite? Like, yeah. you're walking the plank, and it's like, you got to say the one. And if you mm-hmm. get it right, you don't walk the plank. I, I mean, to me, it's hard, because I was, I was shocked. I forgot how little he factors into this movie. Well, but I his scenes so... of, of inspiring them, and, and again, seeing a comedian like Robin Williams kind of literally wax poetic. Well, give I think these boys like these the, things. It's it's so fucking beautiful. I think that's the power of the character. And I think that's why Robin Williams is such an important actor to be John Keating. I think any other actor, you're not going to get the same volume of that looming you're talking about. It's mm-hmm. such an important part of the movie. Like, this man's influence just by existing. Well, because so he was also one guys. of them. And he, he comes back to kind of, like, help out. The others, you know what I mean? They're, but it's just, it's this beautiful, you know, there were moments like when he brings them to the bookcase and he's like, look at these guys, man. They're all fertilizing daffodils now. They were you. They had big dreams and big goals and they loved and they lost. And there is something about the idea that it can all be gone so fast that is fucking beautiful. And the movie doubles down on it because Keating is gone so fast, yeah. right? And you start to think, it's like, again, in your life, like, how many people did you have that not only just were like, that's cute, like, keep pursuing your little thing, right? Like, we talked about in Whiplash, the flippancy of, like, how's your little drum thing going? There's a lot of that, people that, like, to your face will be nice to you, but they don't believe or How many people tell you to go out and just, like, fucking drink deep? You know what I mean? Go out in the fucking fires of the sunlight and fucking drink deep and fucking go for it, man, and... And, you know, love with ferocity, right? Write a poem for that girl. You know, go go fucking try it. And I, in my life, I was trying to think, I was like, I don't know that I even had a Keating. I had people I that think... probably were close, but I think we all watched this movie and you're like, God damn it. It makes you want to be a Keating to other people, right? I think I had a, I, yeah, I feel like I had a lot of like close Keatings, but no, yeah. no one was this impactful. And again, I also think, you know, I'm not a, not an upstanding rich white so i never went to boarding school i'm sure it's a very <laughs> different vibe yeah I'm, sh- I'm sure it's a different vibe when you have to like the public school right people. next to my trailer park wasn't crawling with you know the highly trained keatings but there were a lot of nice people yeah i mean fucking like, try to take I, care of us there a lot of people who tried to like step <laughs> in again i think when you're at a boarding school it's a very different environment where you can you know get away with having a little more personal relationship also with like you know paddling your students as we find the principal does good for him, I guess. Yeah, he got some weird form, dude. He was loving that. He was really because I was like, if I was that. swinging it, I'm swinging it kind of more like a baseball bat, like a full stroke. Yeah. He kind of holds it very phallically and has to like, he's like a washing machine, right? Like a yeah, there's some, real, yeah. there's some real, there's think, some real, I think, I think there's them holes real, drilled in the paddle ain't for aerodynamics. If you get no, my, there's drift. some real, there's some real <laughs> Epstein energy from this guy. I'll be honest. Uh, I. I don't, yeah, it's just it's such a again. I I never went to boarding school. I actually uh, one of our fr- one of my really close friends, uh, Angus, I think did go to boarding school. I've asked him a couple of times. It's like, what's it like? Is it like Dead Poet Society? He's like, no, not even close. He's like, okay, well, yeah, it, it imagine it'd be like that, but if you took out all the like fun and whimsy, yeah, of these, uh, you know, that's the thing. Like my my schools were just like normal schools. But that's okay normal because people. I think that's what makes it such a wonderful movie. Yeah, because <laughs> well, there is something that, about that's boarding what you want schools. Out of it. Yeah, there's something about the boarding school setting, right? Like, of course, we all hate the kind of like rich, we're better than everyone characters in movies. We are designed to hate them, right? Like, we we if you went to public school, but this is the thing. What I think works really well in these boarding school movies, as opposed to just rich people who are like. My life's so hard. Like, what is that? Uh, that Robert Downey Jr. movie in like Beverly Hills, where they're just yeah, rich. less 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 than zero, less than zero, right? She's like, oh, fucking life's hard because we're rich and get to do cocaine by a pool in the hills. You're like, right? I'm well, not like- following. What this is, the boarding school gives us a way. Is one, it, it crystallizes and allows us to still hate the kind of upper crust. We're better than all of you. We right. want to keep people out, but we get to hate them double because we watch what they're doing to their kids. And the suppression and fear and the weight of them projecting this life onto their kids where you watch these kids like they're going to get chewed out by the principal and they have to put on a suit. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. These kind of like rituals and false airs of who do you think you are, man? These kids are just little hormonal boner factories. Like that's yeah. that's well, who they are. Well, like last year we did school ties, which I think is sort yeah. of like the like the um the Cameron of movies like this. The redheaded yeah. stepchild. <laughs> so I would like and it's I, I like school ties. I think it's fun It's movie fine, yeah. But like Dead Poet Society walks and runs so that like all the other movies like this can work because dead poet society is so much more about dead poet society is about all these men discovering all these young men discovering like the sanctity of individualism and how important it is to go through life not just for other people but for yourself i think that that's always what i gather like at least for the first (laughs) for the first hour and yeah. 10 minutes gather ye rosebuds and, while ye may uh yeah. well that's the thing is one is that you see that how much easier it is for them when they were young and children to just follow along but as their bodies start turning on right their their sex drive their hormones the hey man i'm almost out of this boarding school what's that look yeah. like like one of the things that neil keeps coming back to as he is traveling his unfortunate road right mm-hmm. is like when his dad's like you're doing this and you're going to med-. he's like that's 10 more years 10 years he has to live in this fucking forced reality that his parents are putting upon him, that he doesn't get to be himself, that he no longer will have his friends and Keating to inspire his whimsies. Right. Cause I remember as a young kid, just being like, wait, they just fucking choose to go out into a fucking cave and read poetry. I was like, what the fuck? And now that I'm older, you understand, right? You're just like, yeah, anything in life that gives you that, this is more that I'm not just doing something for someone else so I can buy shit I don't need, but something that makes me feel or move. Even if it's just sitting in that cave with your friends and fucking ripping darts for but a moment for a night, you run from underneath the boot and you are just, you're making a choice. This is your little space that you've carved out. You're part of something that matters, right? Cause as he says, like engineering lawyers, uh, doctors, these are noble pursuits that keep society running. You know, he's like, love, poetry. These are the reasons why we need society. This is the reasons why we keep this going and we don't just kill each other and hunt and eat food. It doesn't make sense. Our whole reality doesn't make sense. Why do we put ourselves through all of this, right? It's the true detective. Man's not a natural creature. He became too self-aware. I don't know why I made him the pedophile from Family Guy, but that was my McConaughey for today. But he's like, you know, what our life is against nature. Right. We're the one creature that, you know, sees nature and we reject it and we do this. Poetry is why love is why. Right. These grandiose ideas. And I love the journey of watching, you know, it's really mostly personified through Knox. Yeah. But you watch him where he's just like, fuck, I saw this one girl, the first girl I maybe have ever actually seen since I've become hormonal. uh, Because it's an all boys school. And he's just like, I'm fucking going to risk it all. I'm going to go get beat up by her boyfriend. Great. That's the other thing. Don't kiss a girl when she's asleep on the couch. That's a, a weird move. Not great. Um, I Not think great. they try to make it as less creepy as possible for the era, but even now you're like, no, nah, that's, still, that's still bad. Her boyfriend was right to whoop his ass. No, no. Again, it's important um, to, it's important. Like, listen, just because you thing, go maybe to Keating a boarding did school. put in them like a lot of fucking drive without like a speedometer. Because also when he well, reads the poem to her in class, I was like, I know he thinks this is like adorable and the movie says it pays off. But I was like, God, when she was sinking into her seat, cringing, I was like, yeah, that feels like another attack. Like, I feel like I would fucking be miserable and hate that, too. Um, but again, even as creepy as it plays, I, you could argue, and it's not great. The movie is giving us this kind of safety to say Knox is not a creep and a bad guy. He's just a person who's found true love and that her boyfriend's just a beer drinking jock or, so it doesn't matter what that he believes is true love like he's again he's experiencing these feelings that he's experiencing these feelings that we all feel that, that we all have to deal with but yeah. like you know when you don't have i'm gonna put it this way when you don't have public school to beat it into you that you're not allowed to do certain things <laughs> <laughs> yeah if you don't have people that aren't like well i can't do that they're just like yeah i'll whoop your ass after recess yeah, Let me hammer these nuggets all, and then teach you a lesson. Yeah. 
<laughs> let me ha- let me have so let me have this Mexican pizza. It sounds very really steak day, so I'm gonna do that, and then I'm gonna fucking get yeah. You. I'm gonna have this oct- I'm gonna have this octagon Mexican pizza, and I'm gonna whoop your ass for doing that thing. That's, right. That's the benefit of public school, right there. I'm just gonna say. Yeah. It. yeah, exactly. People don't worry about like what will Esquire Senior think if I fucking rock this dude. You just you get it done. Um, but no, what I think you see though is that Knox is given this this kind. Of, he he's kind of the small. If the movie has a flaw. I think it's very uneven in what it shows us with the kids. Because, like, really the character who you could pull out of the movie and not matter is Todd. Like, yeah, I was going to say, I was Ethan just Hawk's say, character, like, Todd, is kind of the biggest mistake is... of the movie. Well, it's it feels like, like they should have character... pulled, or they should have mixed Todd and Knox, or Todd and Neil, right? Like, Todd should have think... been folded in, this shy guy who is given... Because if Knox was the guy who like can't even read poetry, but then he goes and gets to read poems in front of the girl he loves in front of her classmates, that's a more poignant journey, right? We see the we see the the actual theory of go out and get it while you can, right? Whereas Todd is kind of useless, 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 um, still fucking rats on, you know, fucking the teacher to save himself, and then he stands on a desk, and you're like, yeah, I guess that's cool. Well, I think that's um, what's Todd is kind of like, the fucking Todd limp dick is, of the movie. Well, Todd's supposed to be this avatar for the audience of like, oh, okay, cool. Like, this is a kid who, like, we're all new to this school. Yeah. So we're all supposed to watch this movie through Todd. But I think because Todd is so milk toast and so uninteresting a lot of the time because he's just, he's a timid person, which is fine. Like, being scared mm-hmm. of stuff is part of life. Yeah, but a lot of us because, were that way in high school. You're fucking scared. And but I think to because out. he's so, like, boring i hate to put it that way but like that's the only way i know it. like the he has no all of us have some sort of affectation that makes us he's ourselves so reserved he's that he's so not even an active participant in his life or the movie right exactly so like yeah. us to glom onto him as the audience participator Which I never so did. like like he no, doesn't me matter neither. to I me always, the whole movie he's never like, met because you watch neil neil's and the, you're like neil's the person you that you neil's you who out. i want to be uh you want you either you know this is the neil, classic it's Docs the Breakfast Club. Who do you want to be? You want to be Dalton or you want to be Neil? Right. I think most of us would we settle for being Knox, brave enough to at least we, ask the girl out. What, what do we call him? Have ha, 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 yeah. a Judd yeah. Nelson. Elite, if you want Judd Nelson, but with a touch more elitism, that's this is who it is. That's it's elitist. Guy. Yeah. You don't you don't get this for Christmas when you spill paint in his garage, but yeah. like he still he just, puts on the act. But no, because when you watch like Neil and Nuwanda, you're like, yeah, those guys rock. Those are the the leaders of the pack in high school. That's who you want to be. In a perfect world, you're one of those two. You'll settle for being Knox, who asked the girl out, and you're like, Meeks and Pitts are just zeros. They don't matter. They're just kind of part of the group. They're on their own thing. They're forgettable, yeah. right? But at least they've got the radio. They've got something, right? Todd has fucking zero. Even that piece of shit Cameron is just like, hey, man, my parents have a pretty fucking rad life. I'm getting the nepotism. I'm going to be into the elitist club. Um, yeah. yeah, I want to be a shitty manager someday. Like, I want to be a manager that fires people and gropes the secretary's tits. Like, Cameron is totally just bought into, like, this is great. What are we talking about? And he's a fink, and he's a rat, and he's a piece of shit. And it's his friend's fault because they knew he was that. And why yeah, did they, they think that would fr- change? They shouldn't have been friends with him in the first place. But what I'm saying is Todd is the only, like, true character in the movie that has nothing yeah. again meeks and pitts even have the radio they're trying something todd is an absolute zero we see him he had a brother who was there and beloved he got the same birthday present and then he cries about neil but still fucking caves so to me when he stands at the desk at the end it is still an affecting moment because yeah. we know that he's scared to read poetry it feels like had you folded that journey into one of the other boys, it makes the movie just a little bit stronger, in my opinion. I agree. Like for me, if it had been Knox, if it had been Knox or Dalton, like Dalton particular, uh, yeah, Dalton because he got paddled. If he had been the one, I'd be like, oh, see, shit, Dalton yeah. so immediately was like right on Keating's wavelength that there's not yeah. like a lot of growth there. So I do feel like if you had given Todd Knox's journey. Yeah, Knox. Yeah, Knox. Like pulled it back a little bit, but made it like a much more hard to go for the girl journey. It gives the movie, it just makes it a little more streamlined to me. Um, But maybe that's the thing. Maybe Todd is supposed to be an absolute zero participant. 
so that when he stands on the desk at the end, we're like, this guy has literally been and meant nothing. And now he is taking the stage. He's kind of filling that void that Neil and Nuwanda have left at the school, right? So maybe there, maybe it, it still works. I mean, I would argue this movie's pretretty fucking great and probably doesn't need my fucking half-ass re- revision. But that was something. I was like, Todd is kind of a fucking useless little turd. But yeah. again, what it what it is is you're just you're watching these kids who are not allowed to be kids. And there is something that always is very arresting about watching kids, stories about kids that are forced to live the worst part of adulthood, right? They're forced into these kind of fucking robotic worst versions of, you know, the suit, the rules, the stuffiness. There's something about that that just always works. It's so unnatural. You know what, though, and wrong. Have you ever thought about this though? This is the thing I always think about, especially with movies like this. Mm-hmm. Like high school fucking sucks. No matter how, like, no matter yeah. how, which way you cut it, being like an adolescent having to go through like middle school and high school is just the fucking worst. Yeah, I cannot imagine having to do it and like eat, sleep, and breathe all in the same place. And be like, all right, cool. I'm a completely well-adjusted human being. Yeah, well, imagine your lamest teacher (laughs) sleeping three doors down from you. Yeah, right? Like, like when that dude came out of his room, I was like, oh, God, I never thought they lived there. Ugh, ugh, brother. (laughs) I was like, like, I don't like that. That's not going to work. Like, yeah. No. Well, I was like, imagine all the hard shit you went through in high school. But you also, your parents are more annoying. You have to do it in a fucking suit. You know what I mean? You can't go back by the dumpster and rip a dart with the theater kids. Like, yeah. Yeah, they, it's hard. It's hard to put yourself out. But what, again, it lets Keating become this magical. He's this very mercurial character, right? Where every time we see him, he's kind of got this knowing little grin, right? He's about, like, there's there's a moment, there's just a bit where I can't remember what scene it is. I think it's in the classroom where Robin Williams is just doing his bit. He's just riffing. Classroom. He's just yeah. doing his jokes. And you watch these kids, and, like, Ethan Hawke looks like a goddamn cannibal. Like, he's in the Texas Chainsaw family. He, his fucking mouth is open. His teeth are exposed. It's like he's just waiting for Keating to say the next line. So he's like, oh, my God, I get a laugh. I get to hear something that's not the yeah. same thing. Well, it's because none of them have freedom. ever heard... None of them have ever heard such... Jo- Again, like... Yeah, it, it offers him this mercurial, like, Pied Piper joy. nature. Which in the end is what they hang him on, but you're like, God damn, like the release for us, the audience, is so great. And you're like, imagine the joy those kids must feel walking into class with their fucking fifteen giant leather bound editions. And this guy's just like, Hey man, let's let's talk about like Well the first thing he does is like, Can we rip out the part that gives you a you know, a, a graph? Yeah, if you are trying to put art in a graph, you're failing. Yeah. Right? And that's what this movie is, is it's trying to put children and human lives into a graph, into how yeah. much space do they take up, and that's their value and of like, success. And Look, I think it's always, look, we're parents. It's hard to not want the best for your kids. Mm. I'll say this. I would never do what Neil's dad did. Yeah, it's hard because Kerwood of- Smith is just the fucking man. Like, he's such a great yeah. actor. But there are moments. He's so good. There are moments in this movie. He's so fucking despicable. Because I, I was watching it and I was like, man, so this is where it's going to get hard. And I don't know how much I can talk about, right? But we'll try. But there's this bit where you're just watching Neil in this performance, right? And I used to do theater. I, I fucking loved doing theater, man. It was. I loved it. I, lo- I loved it when you did theater. You find your people and it. Yeah, I, I fucking did a play that you directed, man. It's like you just find your people and you work on this thing and it's so fucking fun. And there's this immediacy of an audience. And you watch Neil up there crushing and you watch him happy and you watch him backstage with the actors and you see like he's found a thing, man. He's like really in. There is a scene when he's backstage and he's watching the audience and his friends are loving it and Keating is loving it. Knox is there with his girlfriend, right? The world is fucking beautiful. Like one of those beautiful snowy nights where the whole world feels blanketed in wonder and magic, right? When his dad walks in in the back and is just glaring and you see Neil fucking cower. Yeah. I love this segment because Neil has to find the fortitude to go out and do his monologue where he's like, you know, let us not, you know, let's repair this fucking bridge. If you yeah, forgive does, me, we'll make it work. Yeah, it's the puck, puck right? This thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's the puck. It's the and, puck monologue at the end. And he's monologuing over the audience right to his father where he's just like, forgive me this trespass. Right. We'll figure this out. 
He's still getting all the grades. He's still working hard. We see that he's still this great fucking kid. He's the leader of his whole friend group. He's got them reading poetry and doing better in life. Like, Neil is one of those guys. You might meet a handful of guys like this in your life. For women, right? You might meet a couple people in your friend group that they just have this magical quality that they, they make life better when they're around. They make you want to be more, aspire to more. When you find out they're going to be somewhere, you're like, oh, my God, we're going to have a great night. That's who Neil is. Yeah. And as he's giving this fucking monologue and he's crushing and it's a great performance and he's got this beautiful, like, youth about him, right? Where he just like, you're just like, God, look at that fucking person full of potential and joy and bravery. And he's monologuing and he looks at his dad who's just looking at him with just fucking withering. Hey, if not hatred, disapproval, embarrassment, shame. And I was sitting there and I, again, it's like one of those as a parent, you're like, I hope that I never lose the thread so much. Yeah. Same. That I would see my sons going for it. Whatever it is. Like, even if my sons were like, I'm going to go fucking, you know, play guitar on a sidewalk and try to busk. Watching yeah. my sons put something into the world. Give their absolute best to something, right? Try to fucking put a little joy and magic in the world. And I would look at them and just be like, I'm fucking embarrassed that you did this to me or that you're not trying to follow the plan. I, it's, and it, again, I don't, I mean, I'd like to get your opinion on this. It doesn't feel like Neil's dead. I think he thinks he's doing the right thing, obviously. I think he truly loves Neil. Yeah. I, like that the, final there's... tragic moment. You get that he, I think he's immediately like he realizes the fucking huge mistake he's made. Um, But that's what life is, man. That's what Keating's talking about. The way we yeah. fucking fall in step and we lose the fucking thread. And yeah. because he lost the thread, he lost, I mean, one of the great people, man. One of the great people is gone I think now. that, I think what's very hard about, it's hard about being a parent, you know, like again, you never know what you're doing. Like I, I, I envy people who think that, that is they absolutely know. true. As a parent, you have no like, fucking I, I, idea. And I think like <laughs> we can sit here and judge. Yeah. It's easy to judge, you know, Mr. Perry because he's such a prick about everything. And yeah. you're like, yeah, yeah. But like, you never know what you're doing. You never know if you're doing the oh, right no. thing. Like I had a world-class I, mother who had a lot of struggles bringing us up. She tells me all the time, she's like, I wish I would have done better. And I was like, that's fucking crazy. You were like, yeah. I would never trade my mom for Zana, anyone. you did great. Well, you're lucky. You have a great mom and dad, right? I have a... Look, Amy's my parents, parents were, were great. Good. So, like, I had a lot of great parents I learned from. And you hear all they, the time from them now that they're older and grandparents even. They're like, we didn't fucking know what we were doing. Yeah. You just go day I by day they, and do your best. And it's... It's scary and it's hard. So you get why Neil's dad, because they says he's like, we don't come from money like Charlie's parents. So his dad is afraid that he's worked so hard for this. And you can only imagine how big of a prick his well, father was. I, right. Well, and I think that's, the, but see, that's the fatal flaw. Yeah. That's like the problem is like, it's not about your son doing good. It's about, I've worked so hard. You're well, going to screw this you're, up. You're, like, you're worried not, about. Yeah, you're trying you're to life-proof you. your kid so that eventually he'll look back and he'll be a stodgy dad who's making sure his kid does right. He's trying to teleport Neil from where he is now yeah, I think to where that, he is in his life, and right. he never stopped. And this is something that I'm telling you, when you go through stuff like this, you will that's the thought you will be haunted by forever is, I was so worried about where things were going, I never appreciated where they were. And I well, think Neil's dad got a fucking reality check, man. It's like you I were think, so yeah. busy trying to make Neil's... him a successful grown up, you didn't let him well, be a I successful think Neil's kid. Dad... Well, I mean, but I think Neil's I think Neil's dad also just the fatal flaw is trying to you're trying to fix the race before it starts. Well and... that I mean that seems to be the whole theory of this school, this life, this kind of it feels like the people who have the resources, it's this fear that like someday they won't because right. that's what well, they value is the money, the time and the respect. And, and what Keating shows Neil is just well, like, hey, man, go out and, you know, these words mean more to Neil than anyone trouble. else. It's borrowing like all these adults here other than Keating, who's like, obviously Keating came from money because he was he's a he graduate. Was there, yeah. so he went to fucking Cambridge like he's yeah. fine. But I think like. For Neil's case particularly, it's just hard. 
there's no this is like I you have to have villains in this movie. Like really honestly the villain is the headmaster. He's a fucking prick. Well, but, I think the villain is the fucking it's the system and the weight of legacy. Kurtwood's like Mr. Perry is Mr. Perry is not he's not a bad guy. He's just so ill-informed for how to Well, this is another his, thing. Let his kid flourish. I think you forget the like 50s-ness of it. Oh yeah, no. You know I mean, what I mean? The, like rewatching it, you put it in the context, and I don't think he was like an aberrant father. But there, there is no, an undeniable is moment in the movie, and again, Neil monologuing to his dad is the entire argument the movie's making. Yeah, which is that you know, be careful how easy it is for you to fall in step. And when Keating tells him, "Find your own voice now," because the longer you wait to look for it, the harder it'll be to find. And again, it's just it's an undeniable image, a human image of this this young kid finding something in passion and love and art and poetry, these things that are wonderful and the flavor of life. And his dad just looking at him completely unmoved. Yeah. As we, the audience, have been on this journey with him and we're so proud of him. When we look through the father's or Neil's eyes and see that fucking look of the dad. I think that's like that's the what thing makes that, him villainous to us, even though the it's first time I watched this. The first time I watched this movie ever was the I was like, oh, this is going to be one of those things where he sees his kid perform and like he's talented and the joy he's filled with while doing this. Like this man is maybe this man will actually be moved to like, I understand that you love this. Like, let's figure out a way that like there's at there's least a middle be fucking ground, so. proud of him as he's getting like, a standing ovation. He got a standing ovation. Give him a hug. Give your kid. Yeah, just a be hug. like, hey man, I don't like how this ended. I don't like that you're lying to me and hiding. But like, we'll but figure it out. We'll figure this out. And instead, he just he's like, you're going to military school. Your fucking shit school. is over. Like I'm going. Yeah. And putting a guy like Neil, who's had this revelation, it's like we're gonna crush you even further. That's like that's the villain. That, that's, that's the fucking villainous see, thing. The villain is that moment because. Robin Williams like, dude, you got to talk to your dad. And he's like, yeah, I, I will. It'll be fine. And he's lying to Keating that he talked to his dad. And Keating kind of knows he's lying. And because uh, there's that scene when he snaps him. He's like, stay away from my kid, Keating. Yeah. Like, whatever. Like, you know, you almost don't blame him for that. But when he is sitting there and he's fucking telling him, he's like, I've worked too hard for this. Blah, blah. And Neil's like, you never ask what I want, how I feel. And he's just like, tell me, tell me what, he, what, what, what? And the dad fucking challenges him. And you watch in that moment, Neil's like, there's no fucking way he'll hear me. There's no way. There's no way he'll hear me. And even if he does hear me, it'll be deaf ears. And Mm -hmm. the striking power of that moment where the whole movie we're told about the power of words and the power of dreams and art and poetry. And you're for a guy like Neil to be like, fuck my dad. It won't matter. Like my next 10 years are gone regardless. And even though his life still could have been filled with poetry and ideas and spreading joy and making new friends and whatever, um, it's kind of this short sightedness of youth. He does. He can't because a kid who's 17, another 10 years, that's a long fucking time to them. And he just he can't he can't imagine that there will still be that magic around him because right now in a repressive system, he still found it. And in the next repressive system, guys like me will find it. He couldn't see it because his dad's face. Well, I think Absolutely this is the other, fucking slammed the door on this his is The other thing I always think about with this is, you know, he, wa- he wants his son to be a, a doctor, mm-hmm. move on to medical school, that kind of thing. And look, I I was not smart enough. I'm not smart enough to be a doctor or anything. <laughs> my like parents that. knew pretty quick this was not an option. <laughs> no, my mom and dad figured out pretty early on that, like, yeah, I think when I did the play, they're like, well, at least it's not, not smoking weed, you know, in a car yeah. somewhere. Like, he's doing something. <laughs> I think that Maybe the hardest too. thing about, but like to be so dispassionate about being a doctor, like Neil shows no interest in that at all. And for you to just force that on your kid, that's like the real terror. Yeah. Of, well, that's the real it's terror of like, imagine the moment when he f- finds Neil, you see oh, God. this human devastation, right? And it's the, you know, the cloud and the what. Like you see the fucking you see that he is a human man. He like he is a person. It's, it's still but again, a father the idea with a son. of like and it's a good lesson to internalize, man, is when you're so busy about the game and the rules and the system and like 
just looking at your kid with that hardness and not in some way, just like when you're in the middle of a fight, just be like, you know what? Let's fucking take a breath. Like, give me yeah. a hug. Let's take a breath. And and again, all this shit is fixable. We're in this giant fucking library with leather bound yeah. editions. Like, we're going to be I've fine. This, this is yeah. fucking like we've had this thing. This He doesn't look at him like he's a fucking human. Yeah. Like, we've had this thing with the kid this summer where he's like, you know, it's the summer. We don't tell him what to do or anything like that. I mean, we tell him what to do, obviously. We're not, you know, just walking away from the kid. But, like, this is not the same thing at all. But, you know, ice cream and popsicles. It's the summer. So there's, like, lots of stuff like that. And he wants it at, like, 9 o'clock in the morning. I'm like, no, dude. Like, yeah. that's not going to happen. Like, you need to have breakfast and stuff like that. But there is, like, especially after watching this yesterday, I was like, Fuck. Am I like denying some child's bliss by like not having like a nine o'clock? You're fucking eating eat a whole thing of ice cream. It's fine. But, I just again, I like, think it's one of it's those. It's a microcosm of the thing, which is it just is. like but you want your kid. You yeah, want you, like, your kid to do the best. You've been alive and made a lot of mistakes and learned a lot of wisdom. Mm -hmm. yeah. But what I think we forget is that when a kid hits a certain age, they don't want our wisdom. Like a lot of this shit is hard earned. And that being, you know, kind to them and being someone they can talk to is your best way to get that in. It's the yeah. uh, spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down, right? If you're a huge mm -hmm. fucking prick to your kid and look at him like he's a fucking mutant that you don't recognize because he did a play, he's probably not going to hear your maybe even rightful ideas on, like, the future and what's coming and this and that. Whereas maybe if you're just like, hey, man, I'm fucking proud that you tried. And yeah. that anything you do, give it your fucking best, and I'm proud of that at minimum. I um, think... there, there's something about again, it's it's this perfect kind of place for the story to end, where it's this what what makes us human, what makes life worth fighting for, and you see so clearly. And again, I'm not even saying that his dad was you know all the way wrong. And it, if you think of the society I mean, at the time, most he, dads would have been in his shoes. He's not all the way wrong because he doesn't realize what he's doing. He thinks he's looking out for his child. Well, because he he's, he's, doing he's the best a guy who he never can. had a Keating. He didn't have he a father. He never found like his that. fucking voice. He never found exactly. art. He found money and success and hard work. And so he's preaching from the wrong book. It's not a bad book. It's not an evil book. It's not a book. bad book. It's just the different system. Again, the wrong this one. is the value of like having more Keatings in the world. Right, having more times where we value art, we value stories, we value discussion, and in these things that are feel like everyone thinks are less important, right? Plays and stories—that's flippant. You know, that's not important. But this is when it matters, right? This is had his dad clapped and just cheered for his fucking son. Someday he probably would have held a grandkid, right? Like, Neil would have been fine. Um, you see yeah. the the toll this whole thing takes on the mom when she's trying to comfort him. Her own son, and he's just like, I was fucking good, man. And even her, she doesn't fucking give that, you know, I'm sure you were. I wish I could have seen it. You know, she will live with the fact that she didn't fucking go because, you know, her husband said no. And again, the whole society was repressive back then, but... um. There is a striking weight to watching Neil, who is the most lovable person in the movie, right? The one who helps Todd throw the desk and is just like, he starts the dead poets. Like, he's really lusting for life in a way that so few of us do. Yeah. Hit a point where he's just, life's not worth it for him anymore. And it's, it's a striking, horrifying image. And for, you know, those of us that have gone through this journey... One of the hardest things to think is that, man, my person didn't, because it feels personal to you, even if it's not, right? When someone's in this moment, they're so low and so hard, like the pain they're in is almost unimaginable, I'm sure. Um, and even if you think you've been close and you've dealt with stuff like this, man, you pulled back, right? That's great. Imagine not being able to pull back. Um, you, you can't see a fucking road anymore. And there is a... There's a way it feels like an attack on you where it's like, why wasn't it enough that he'd just get one more day with me? But that's not the thing. And then you start thinking back and you're like, fuck, well, think about the last 10 days we had. And was I present? Did I care?
did I talk to them about shit or did I try to dodge it because it might be too messy, you know? Um, it's horrible, man. It's and there's no good it's ways tough. around it. And again, I don't, I don't think anyone in this movie is a villain. But I think what we learn is that repression is the villain. When you hide from life, life's gonna come and find you. Right, like just you can't close it off and be as inhuman as this school thinks the pillars will make them. Um, yeah. And I do wonder as the movie goes forward, what will Neil's dad ever have the ability to think on his decisions? Will he be full of regret? Will he replay the thing he was so mad about that play? Will that become one of his most cherished moments, or will that always haunt him? Right. That he didn't grab Neil the night before. It's just that that thing. And you hope that all of the people that go through this find a little poetry, man. Because um, that's the thing I'm dealing with, right? When your person's gone, they're, they're gone. And there's nothing that'll fix it. And all the suffering and torment won't fix it. Um, especially unnatural deaths like this. Yeah. It's hard. So then it's like, you know, when I watch this movie as fucking hard as it was yesterday and I made a fucking huge mistake picking this movie, it at least reminded me of what they opened the meetings with, which is suck deep on the marrow. And Keating even adds later, that doesn't mean fucking choke on the bone. Doesn't mean choking on the bone. Um, But yeah, you have to kind of recommit and double down to the good things in life. Because... Sadness is an infinite well, man. You can go down as far as you want. You can let yourself be miserable and give up on everything. But that's where we find the moments in this movie, right? The things I remembered about it that I wanted to do in my sad moment was relive those openings. I wanted to be Knox riding down that hill with swans flying, going to fucking see about a girl, you know? Or even when Todd runs out after he finds out about Neil. And he just looks out at the snow-covered vista. He's like, it's beautiful, man. It is beautiful, even when it's bad. It um, There's beauty. I don't know. I wish that I had better words, right? Like, when you go through something like this, you're like, man, I wish I could say the thing that would help the next person. Um, I'm not I'm not smart enough those... or, or, or good enough at anything to, like, I, I'll not just what tell you is, it's like... just fucking, it's an unbearable torment. And what I've decided to do, and, you know, it helps doing this with you and watching movies and having stories, is you just, you choose to drink deep the things that make life worth living, hopefully. I don't know. I I agree. I, I, I still like think it's a, it's a wonderful movie, man. It was... Look, it's, <laughs> a beautiful mo- it's, a beautiful, look, it's a beautiful movie about the pursuit of individualism. I think when you're in your 30s and 40s, life changes your perspective on it a little bit so you view it a little differently but well, it is one of that, those now we watch it and we're like Ooh, we're way closer to the end than the start i bet yeah <laughs> that though that aspect of individualism and carpe diem though i don't think ever goes carpe away carpe diem how so did I we not mention it but see again to your point great reminder that's the trick man is i'm trying it it's not easy but you just wake up and just say, man, today, something can happen today. Something good. And like, I, I'll i never not love movies about that. About people trying to just, all right, this is where I am. This is who I am. Something good can happen today. Let's go. Right? Like, there is something that it's so easy for us to forget. To fucking stop. And just look around and be amazed. Like, literally be amazed. We are surrounded by magic at all times, right? Like, well, right now, today, I've got 50 things on my checklist already. My hand's fucking sliced open. I was at the ER. I'm like, God damn it. But, like, at some point, I was sitting there, like, stressed out this morning. I looked over, and my little son crept out in his underwear. He thought he was, like, Mission impossible through the room so he could try to get his iPad and play on his iPad, and I wouldn't notice. And I just fucking laughed. I was like, that's worth it. Like that yeah. moment well, was, will get me through. I was just about to say, like, usually, like, we I, we do these pretty early in the morning. So usually around this time, like, we're, like, you know, like we are now, close to wrapping up. <laughs> I sit down and I start hearing my kid call. And I'm like, oh, he's awake. Yeah. And it is, like, one of the, like, 
if you want to see like magic. And look, I'm not saying that you have to have kids to see that, but Dude, when you do have, have, a, a kid, have a dog, go on a walk and see a go fucking on a dog, pond. Go, go on a sit walk, by water. Have a dog. You like, know what I mean? Like there are anything. so many other places to find magic in the world. Don't go find that, kids like, that aren't your own. That's that's crime magic. That's bad. That's bad. That's not good. <laughs> That is like that is magic you should not be participating. That's bad. In. But that's dark magic. Like yeah. find the thing that's gonna <laughs> give you the magic for the day because it, it's hard, man. Like I, it's hard to and it's hard to be mindful of that I for, I fuck it up all the time. But yeah, I I would know. like to leave the audience with that is whatever you think is going on, man. It's not that bad. Like it will get better. It will be something that. Hopefully you withstand. If you need help, fucking please ask people for help. Um, if someone asks you for help, be available to that. Believe me, um, it's the one thing that all of us wish we could change. Is that we wish we would have taken that extra call, gone out and had that fucking extra coffee, talked about it when we could. Because once that option is no longer available to you... Um, it's just like a haunting emptiness I will have forever now. Like there's just something that I'll never be able to square that math. So not to, you know, I know no one listens to these pods to fucking think about all this horrible shit or be, you know, have someone fucking harping on them. Um, reach out, yeah, reach out. Okay. And if someone is brave enough to reach out to you, um, it's okay. If it makes your day messy, it's okay. Yeah. If you lose a day to messiness, um, because believe me, you're going to lose a lot of days out. to regret. Yeah. If you don't, Re- if you don't handle these things, or at least yeah. try, at least try. Reaches That's all out, you can do, man. Out. On both That's sides, fucking try, fucking try, find some magic. Um, it's out there. It's out there, and hopefully, uh, everyone's still listening and not fucking mad at me. <laughs> Sorry, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be back to more. Guys, fucking toilet humor next week. Guys, we love you. As always, make sure that you are rating, reviewing, subscribing. Please join us on Patreon. I mean, it's a buck. Patreon! Like, gather ye rosebuds yeah. and give us a buck. Gather ye bonus content while ye may. We've got, I mean, we've got Tales from the Griff going on. I've got a little thing I'm cooking up. Yeah. We've got all kinds of cool stuff. Tales and from of the course, Griff is a great place to find us because there's no way to get emotional. <laughs> also, October coming in real hot. I'm so excited. Pumped this year. for the mega we're, marathon. We're gonna do. We're gonna. We're gonna do the Omen. Like yep. this is like th- this one is like the one that I've been waiting. Oh, for. dude! And so, if those of you who caught the first Omen this year, like a shockingly metal, awesome entry. Yeah. Which I was not expecting. It is. I was not either. We're doing it's, the X be, trilogy. We're X-trilogy, doing critters. Critters. We got a lot of good shit. It is a lot of good shit coming. A lot of good shit. Coming. Um, email us. Oh, we're on all the same socials. Tell us what you like. Tell us what you don't like. We want to make the show the best it can be for you. Yes. You alone. Fuck yes. We love you. Thank you very much for coming back to school with us. We'll be back next week for the end of the show. I love you guys.